Yes, we are live now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the twenty-first episode of Let's Talk Inclusion. I'm your uh, host, Madhavina Chakraborty. I'm an inclusive education consultant based in India, and uh, of course, uh, the founder of the global inclusion advocacy platform, uh, I for Inclusion. I'm delighted to welcome my guests of today's show. They are two very renowned education consultants with huge experience in FEND inclusion. Uh, Mr. Michael Purchase from the UK and Ms. Amala Arora, who is currently based in India. Hi, Michael. Hello, Mala. Hi. Welcome to Let's Talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, could you please give our viewers a brief introduction to your life and work, Michael? Thank you, Manavina. And well, thank you, Manavina. You've, you've, you've asked me back again. So this is the second time I've been with you. So, uh, so I feel privileged <laughs> and honored to have been welcomed back again. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, hello everyone. My name is Michael Purchase. I'm, uh, I'm in, here in the UK. Uh, my career was, has mainly been in special education. Um, I've had interface with uh, mainstream schools, but my main my main role has been in special education. I was a special school head teacher for um, close to 19 years. Um, since then, uh, the last few years, I've been um, involved in teacher training um, and providing uh, training and consultancy to schools around inclusion. So I focus on on SEND. Um, uh, a lot of my work has been around behaviour. Um, and I've I've been I've led uh, some reducing exclusions projects with with a number of schools and local authorities. So, so yeah, inclusion has been um, it's been my career really. So, uh, and I'm delighted to come and um, come on here again. Thank you, Manavina. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm so glad that you are here for the second time. <laughs> and uh, Mala, could you please tell our viewers a little more about yeah. yourself? Hi, Manavina. Hi. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for having me here. And uh, hi, Michael. Um, good evening uh, to all. Um, my name is Mala, and um, I'm an independent education consultant working in the field of inclusion, diversity, and mental health. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of 21st uh, episode of uh, Let's Talk Inclusion. Um, I have been working with uh, a lot of schools here in India and um, government institutes, mainly uh, spreading um, the idea of inclusion that how our society can be inclusive and meet the needs of all children. Um, and so I am bringing my experience of UK of, 20, of 12 years of uh, experience of UK in India. And I do plan to do some, some work in India. Um, and yeah, so this is maybe the beginning now. Thank you very much, Mala. Thank you for being my guest this evening. So uh, before we start... Before we start today's discussion, uh, I would like to share a video here. Michael, you remember you sent a video to me, and uh, we could uh, like our we would like our viewers to write in the comment sections uh, what they have understood by watching the video. So here it is. This story time. I'm going to be reading my hair written by me, Hannah Lee, and illustrated by Alan Fatima Haran. Are you ready to jump in? Let's go! My birthday is coming up so soon. I'll need new clothes to wear. But most of all, I need to know, how shall I style my hair? Let me do your hair, jokes daddy. I'm getting better, I swear! Mommy rushes in the room. Daddy, don't you dare. Off we go to the hairdressers to get it done professionally. As for what style I choose, you'll have to wait and see. Miss Dawn has lots of magazines just so you can get a clue of the kind of hairstyle that you would like to do. Whilst I'm looking through them, my imagination starts to grow. I start to think of all the hairstyles I already know. Mummy has the most dazzling dreadlocks. Such a joy to see them swing. I like to practice plaiting them. 
It is my favourite thing. My sister likes to experiment. There's not a look that she won't try. Bantu knots, a high top fade. Braids, she's not shy. My brothers both have cornrows with different shapes, patterns and lines. They love to show them off at school yelling, come see the best designs. Daddy says, shave all over please. When he sits in the barber's chair, his beard is shiny, curly and full. That's where he likes his hair. Can you do a beard at home? Do this. Ooh. Uncle has waves that are so all smooth, swirling all over his head. He keeps his hair brushed and neat. <sighs> Don't forget the do-rag before bed. Auntie's hair is shaved real short, much like the head of a lioness. She is so cool, stylish and carefree. That's how she likes it best. Can you do the sound of a lioness? A nice big roar! Baby cousin is so small. She hasn't much hair yet. Already it's begun to grow. She'll have loads soon, you can bet. Grandma's hair is short and cropped. There are many curls of gray. She says she found one years ago and invited them all to stay. Invite all of those hairs to stay. Say, come on, come on. Grandpa wears turbans, tie heads and scarves, his hair tucked away from his face. For Grandpa has so much hair, that's how he keeps it in place. Time to take a look at my friends and what styles they wear. After all, I still don't know how I'll style my hair. Ryan will have plaits with bows. Her mummy can do them fast. Put a bonnet on, she says, to make the style last. Michael has a mohawk. Brandon is short back and sides. They go to the barbers together and chat while the cutter nah, glides. Nina is my best friend. What style? She asks with a pout. I want to try something new. Maybe a twist out. It's been 45 minutes, cries Miss Dawn. What will you do with your hair? Time to let mummy decide. Don't you think that's fair? So mummy whispers in my ear. And that's exactly when I know the hairstyle that I will wear will be my afro. I love my afro when it's out. So big and great and free. My daddy says it is my crown. It defies gravity. A creation to which none could compare. I'm so glad it's mine. I love my hair. I had so much fun reading my hair and I hope you did too. Re yeah, so Michael, would you like to say something about it? Yeah, I, I mean, every every week um, we, we show that to prospective students um, at the university that I work with. Um, and it's it's one of the it, it's several levels to it, isn't there? You you recognise so for teacher tr for you know prospective teachers we we you know they, we like them to note um, the enthusiastic style of the reader, um, how engaging she is, um, and we can talk then about children with special educational needs and disabilities who might need, you know, maybe a more visual approach, um, you know, a larger than life storyteller, and that's what, that's how we want our teachers to be, isn't it? Enthusiastic and engaging for children. Um, there's also though the the diversity and difference element and, and it's sort of celebrating difference and diversity and individual uniqueness and and it's one of the things that you know it, it wasn't that long ago in this country where where children who were black or from you know ethnic never saw themselves in books it was always always white faces in books and um and and so it, it's good for them to see themselves and celebrate um, the way they look. So there's a lot of learning can go on there, an acceptance of difference um, and, and, a, and a celebration of, of, of diversity. I, I think the, 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 the key is that, um, I, think it, I think it's about our curriculum in the UK. Um, and I, we'll talk in, in a moment, I'm sure, about the curriculum, how important it is, that 
it's that this sort of approach is embedded in in our particular early years curriculum. I mean, that that story there maybe for our year one, year two pupils, um, but it, it's it's a good way of of starting to teach about difference and diversity and celebrating that. Um, I mean, you, you know, and the, the better candidates will, they will say, well, it's not just about race and ethnicity. It's about special educational needs. You know, if a child's maybe in a wheelchair or or, or has some, you know, quirky behaviours, you know, as a result of, um, you, you know, their, their, their ADHD or, or autism or something, you know, it, it's to be celebrated and shared and talked about and understood, really. So, yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, and I hope, hope everyone else does. Yeah. Actually, the concept of diversity uh, takes various forms and is uh, incorporated into many aspects of our life. So we have differences in religion, gender, culture, family structure, physical and or intellectual abilities, and many more. And studies have shown that meaningful inclusion should start from early childhood. And that is exactly mm. our topic today. So I'd like to come to you, Michael, uh, once again, and then I will go to Mala. Uh, so Michael, what is your opinion about the meaningful inclusion in early childhood, to be precise? And as you were um, uh, speaking about the system in the UK, if you could just tell us about how it is in the UK. Yeah, yeah, happy happy, happy to, to help with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, in the UK, on 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 one level, we 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 have an inclusive education system. Um, you know, I, th I think I think we do generally recognise here, um, and we're not unique. I mean, I think there's a lot of examples all around the world, but I, I think we do recognise that that inclusive education that values diversity and uniqueness. Um, you know, it, it, it's something is to bring to the classroom. Um, we want children to feel safe in school and to have a sense of belonging. Um, we want students and their parents to participate in, you know, setting learning goals and, and making decisions. Um, and a lot of schools will have staff where they're trained and they're supported to be flexible and they have resources. So I think, I think there is that general view that 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 we that we want inclusive education. And I suppose who wouldn't, in a way? Um, you know, schools and, and nurseries, you know, we're talking about very uh, young children. Um, you know, we play an important part in shaping children's attitudes and, you know, in, tr in truly inclusive schools will instill that understanding of respect and respect for difference. So, and there's lots of lots of research has been done, isn't it, on, on, I think it's called contact theory, I think it is, you know, the more time that we spend with people on an equal footing that are different to us, then the more likely we are to find out about them and 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 develop you know understanding of their differences and and acknowledge it and um, you know when i was at school I, I never saw any children in my school with special educational needs really i mean i could think back and i can think of a few children now i can look back and think actually yeah they probably did have something um and i can now start to think well were they autistic perhaps did they have adhd you know yeah i can but at that time um, more, you know, there were more children in special schools. And when I went into special education, um, you know, back in the back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, children with very moderate needs were in special schools. Now, those children now in the UK, they are in mainstream schools. Now, there's a view of, well, are they is that the best place for them? Are they doing well? Um, because some children do very well. But I still hear on a regular basis, particularly from parents who are crying out for help, saying their child is not getting the provision they need, that the, the, the child is not getting the resources that they need. So there's there's a lot of this tensions in the systems. But, you know, do I think it's a good thing? Yeah, I, I do. And, and, and I, I think most people, I think most people would think it's a good thing. And, you know, the my, my hair, um, that story, I think, is is a typical story that will be told in schools you know as as i sit here i'm sure at the end of the school day now that could well be a um a story that's being read we have offset in this country we have a you know a, a, an inspection system that is well embedded now they will they will check on on inclusive practice and scnd provision uh we have equalities legislation um we have an scnd code of practice for schools and 
a system where children can get education, health and care plans, which gives them some protection in terms of the provision that is needed to meet needs. Um, but there's always a but, isn't there? Again, not all children do get that correct provision for a range of reasons. Uh, it's often about accountability. It's often about poor leadership in schools, I would say. Um, and exclusions are high. You know, I work on reducing exclusions projects and the number of children that are excluded, there will be a disproportionate number with some form of SEND. Um, they come from a black and uh, an ethnic minority group, perhaps. So, so yeah, so I, I think what we're saying in this country, there is a strong will, but there's still a lot to do in terms of truly inclusive practice, I'd say. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Michael, for the input. Since Mala and I uh, have also lived and worked in the UK, we can understand this well. Mm. And uh, honestly speaking, we have a long way to go as for the meaningful inclusion is concerned in India. What do you think, Mala? Okay, All right. As you said, Manavina, um, well, it is important to understand what inclusive practices are and uh, therefore what really inclusion is all about. So there is no you know, denying fact that India's makeup as a country is not as the UK. You know, we have many states and unfortunately education is a state subject. Uh, we come across many schools claiming to be inclusive. Uh, however, in reality, there is a confusion and ignorance about the under understanding of inclusion. And uh, therefore, um, we see very little of inclusive practices in action in India. Uh, whereas um, in the UK, um, there is a set curriculum, as Michael just mentioned, a framework under which the schools are inspected of the work they do. So uh, there is some uh, answerability there. Uh, and this is the broader difference, uh, I would say. And just to take a few examples of uh, inclusive practices, I would say the foremost is the access to education. You know, although we have uh, acts and policies like Right to Education and RPWD Act, but we at the same time know how many children are not given admissions in the mainstream school or are cajoled into leaving media because of not performing as per their peer or national standard. So uh, this is discriminatory and is completely against the RT in RPWD Act. Um, and in majority of states in India, there is no tracking system on how the how how the schools are dealing with admission process. Um, so whereas in the UK, it's a transparent system where all children go through the uh, same electronic admission process and are allocated schools. I'm sure you know about that, uh, Manivana. And um, yeah. so another important inclusive practice uh, is about access to curriculum and services, the human resource in the form of multidisciplinary team. So uh, now in my experience of working in the UK and India, I would say that no country can claim that, you know, they have attained 100% success in adapting their resources, as Michael said, or curriculum uh, to meet the needs of all children. So struggles are everywhere. However, adapting and providing the right package to the individual is important. Now that package would have services and interventions as per the need of the individual. So that may include therapy sessions, that would be remedial sessions, assessments, just to name a few. And in the, in the UK, uh, where I was seeing that multidisciplinary approach works wonderful, um, that all the professionals come together and look at the child as, as, a, as, a, as an individual. And then they put all the professionals who should be in there working towards the uh, um, you know, to, to meet a goal. So um, understanding the needs, the rights, act, and the framework is the uh, most important, I think, when we are looking at practice um, in attaining uh, inclusion as a, in, the, in society. And um, how inclusive do you find the society itself here in India? Oh, OK. <laughs> Right, I can go on and on on that. Um, <laughs> see, uh, needless to say about the physical barriers we come across in our daily life. Mm -hmm. as, as a society, we do lack in providing accessibility, you know, at various level. So it could be, uh, you know, free to move freely around. So we're talking about transport, the infrastructure, buildings, recreational activities like, you know, cinema, going to cinema or having parks. 
Um, so, you know, I do personally have a problem with the language also, you know, used in our policy policies or by the policy makers, like uh, I would say term like rehabilitation. So if you look at the dictionary meaning, uh, it's absolutely different from the purpose of the existence of Rehabilitation Council of India um, or a term uh, which we recently have been given, Divyang, you know, which has again um, brought the whole idea of disability and inclusion into a charity box, um, so to say. And uh, when we talk about inclusion, Usage, usage of such language and attitudes create a, create a wall, um, especially when we are considering inclusion on the basis of equity. Um, and what we really see around ourselves is either the medical model or the social model of disability. And we see lack of effort towards sensitization uh, as well in our society. So not only uh, mainstream schools, but the entire society, I think, um, we as a society are insensitive and we thrive on stereotypical. Uh, we expect our parents to be superhuman and, you know, not show sign of weaknesses or struggles. Um, so we we also are not trained to receive feedback. You know, we, we find it very, uh, we find it as a criticism. Uh, and that becomes one of the hurdles when we expect others to know what, you know, we are going through as, as a parent. Um, I may be tired. I may do very well on a day with my child, but there are struggles. And I, I tend to not share my emotions with people because I feel that I will be, be judged on that. So as a society, uh, the sensitization is where I think we, we do have to work on. You know, we are not kind of there when it comes to our society being sensitive. So voicing out, so, you know, sharing is very important, I feel. And uh, I also feel that uh, the social media it provides uh, that platform where people do share experiences and it's, you know, also gives you a sense of anonymity as well. So, you know, across the planet, you can see uh, parents sharing their experiences, which I think is very important in be becoming aware and uh, knowing about the vulnerability which exists in our efforts of making our society inclusive. Yeah. Very true. I also feel that while most of us are uh, working to prepare dis a disabled child for the world, not many are looking at preparing and empowering the society to include them. And uh, I personally feel that handling disability issues cannot be a finite mission where there are various levels of misconceptions the general public lives with. Uh, could you please mute yourself, um, Mala, if there is a feedback? Cool. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I keep interacting with my collaborators from, who are based in some of the African countries. Uh, they face the same kind of challenges, uh, not more, whatever we are facing uh, here in India. And uh, first of all, uh, many of us are yet to understand the actual meaning of inclusion or maybe since we are talking about the early childhood inclusion so they really do not understand the actual meaning of early childhood inclusion so michael being the most experienced professional among us today if you could elaborate on that please maybe after that we'll come to the societal um, sense. okay okay so the ideal practices is that what you you wanted me to focus on yes yes please yeah i, I mean I, I think the last time that I was um, I was with you, Manabina, I, I talked a lot about leadership, and 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 I still I still say that leadership is is absolutely key um, to inclusive practice. And I mean, one of the the, the 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 things that I was most proud of when I was a special school head was that that we had a lot of our children who were on the register of a special school. They spent. Um, all of their time or a big part of their time in mainstream schools I, you know we, we 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 had good relationships with schools and and schools that had some spare capacity in terms of building they were happy to have our children in the school um and some of them access mainstream lessons and 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 on on the on the face of it it was a really good thing um you know the children had a broader experience um the parents liked it as the parents their child put the school uniform on of a local mainstream school and, and they went to that school. So they, they were really pleased with that. Um, the children 
in the host school, the mainstream school, also, as I was saying, got a bit of a got a bit of better understanding of children with special educational needs and you know diversity and difference. The the difficulty was though that because they were not on their register, the school wasn't accountable for their progress. So where it worked best, the leaders of the mainstream schools really wanted it to happen. They really wanted the children from the special school to belong in their school as opposed to just being in their school in a room and going into some of some of the lessons. And the mainstream teachers, if, if they if they didn't have a leader that was really um, stressing the importance of inclusion, then they they didn't feel able to or they didn't feel any imperative to adapt their lessons. So. You know, it, on one level it worked really well, but on another level it didn't work. And and I wouldn't say it would be a disaster, but lead, leadership, you know, counted. And and in terms of the the work I do now, in terms of reducing exclusions project, the schools that have the most success in reducing exclusions are where the leaders really, really want every member of staff in their school, everyone in their community, to to assume that every child belonged in that school. And wasn't always thinking, well, this child doesn't belong here because they're causing me a lot of upset in my lessons and they should be they should be sent to the pupil referral unit down the road and these sort of things. So it's really important. So I can't stress enough leadership and I'll, I'll bang on about it day in, day out. You know, it, it's, it's creating that culture in a school. And if, if teachers are in that school, they will be supported. They will be innovative in their curriculum design. You know, the curriculum will be child centred, solution focused. Um, They'll be keen to use technology to help children, you know, in learning and communication direction. And those leaders will make sure that all of their staff have really good training and they feel confident then to to have children in their class with a really complex need. So th- those are the, the key elements. I mean, I would say it's about using teaching assistants or specialists um, that can be good to provide extra support. There is a it's a double edged sword, though, because. If specialists take children out of their classroom and do something with them, that's not inclusive. And similarly, some teaching assistants that I've known, and perhaps you do, will say, will will make them make children more dependent on them instead of creating them as independent learners. So, it is a double-edged sword. Inclusive curriculum, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I you know, that that is that is absolutely essential. Um, I would say parental and student involvement is vital to an inclusive school, um, not just school ringing a parent every now and again or having a termly meeting of 10 minutes and no more, um, but truly co-producing. You know, there's, there's, there's something we talk about in the UK a lot. I don't know if it's filtered over to, to India yet, but the whole kind of co-production where, where I, I as a teacher would sit down with the student and the parent with a blank sheet of paper and start to write down what the needs are and what the provision we need and some strategies. It would be, you know, truly produced because often a teacher or a professional will write a report and a strategy, wave it in front of a parent and a student and say, you're happy with this. And before they get a chance to say yes or no, they're, they're out the door. So I think that, that thing around co-production is, is absolutely vital. Um, so, that was, so it's leadership, curriculum, training, co-production that would be my my big four i suppose for want of a better term indeed indeed thank you very much michael would you like to add something to it mala um well just to add to what michael has said um as we all human beings would like to be part of the majority and you know for a young child with a disability this may mean going to a same school as peers of uh, his and her age and um, outside the school, it's about socializing or playing with children of same in the same age group in the neighborhood. Maybe. And must, one must understand that this accessibility is important and it does have an impact on their social skills, uh, which is an important uh, foundation for forming and uh, maintaining school friendships in early elementary grades. Um, and uh, um, I believe are also important um, in terms of adjustments and academic gains. So any child should uh, not be deprived of being with the age appropriate peer group uh, in the school or outside the school. Um, and because this is very important for their self-esteem and maintaining relationship later in the life. 
Um, I would also mention that um, you know the fact that uh, we all believe, as a professional working in the field, that early identification and early intervention are the key practices, um, and we have been propagating that. Um, and to attain this, the existence of a powerful leadership, as uh, Michael mentioned, um, and multidisciplinary team in all schools is absolutely vital. It's unavoidable. Um, and then working together to build a, a holistic program for the, for the child is the prime responsibility of the school. And yes, we do expect the schools to act professionally and take the responsibility when it comes to planning for the child. Um, it should not only be limited to have a child with a condition um, engaging socially during the you know, activity periods or lunchtime only. Um, it, it, and it should not be treated as a you know, babysitting job for the teacher, whoever is available, whoever has a free period to you know, looking after those children who have got ambition in the school. Um, they should be meaningfully engaged. Um, and when we talk about outside the school, I will just um, you know share one of the um, developments which have which I came across in the UK um, was that uh, one of the supermarket uh, there introduced a quiet hour, which was to empower persons with uh, autism and other conditions who would find uh, shopping during the rush hours overwhelming. Uh, so yeah, this this came as a huge intervention for the children to feel comfortable when they. Um, or in the supermarket with their parents. So uh, it also was very helpful for the adults with disability or any condition to shop without that chaos around um, of the normal rush hour. So I think outside the school also, where we talk about inclusive practices, these are certain, um, you know, uh, these are certain actions which can be taken by uh, various organizations. Yeah, and also I think all these things come from the society. And uh, in uh, here, uh, I can say that we are an overwhelmingly ableist society. We see additional needs or uh, neurodivergence as a lack or absence that makes an individual inferior and uh, keeps them from having a fulfilling life as defined by the mainstream values. Uh, we have internalized ableism as the norm and disability as a deviation. And believe it or not, in urban areas where we generally live in apartment complexes, the complexes usually have gardens and children play areas, nice play areas, but you will hardly find any neurotypical child playing with a neurodivergent child. And uh, even if children want to do so, their parents will not allow them. So we are actually not aware of the benefits of inclusion for both neurotypical and neurodivergent children from their early childhood. Michael, if you could uh, tell us about it. Uh, I'm sure in your uh, long career, you must have witnessed the benefits for both neurotypical and neurodivergent children. Yeah, I, I mean, it. it society here in the uk you know that I, I suppose some would describe it as quite tolerant um and that's a good example marla of of you know my local supermarket um a couple of days a week they'll have a they'll have a trying to make it more um uh accessible i suppose you know the lights are, aren't as bright that the 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 music isn't on and and so it it does help doesn't it um I think I think in the UK we're, we're we're very tolerant towards um children and young people with a physical disability. I, I think there's a lot of you know a thing around ramps and access for wheelchairs and you know people get cross when cars park on the pavement um and doesn't allow wheelchair access. I think the 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 issue uh and I I'm sure that's the same the world over it's those young people who have an invisible disability you know like autism or ADHD you know that when when they when they are as they are sometimes you know people will will judge them as as antisocial naughty not complying um blame the parents you know parents get tutted at in supermarkets when their child falls on the ground and has a meltdown and uh, so it, it's 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 very common is that and um and, that, and and a lot of parents tell me how difficult that is you know they feel they're judged and yeah, I mean, going back to the question about, you know, the benefits of inclusive education, I, I think we've covered it in a, in, a, in a way that, you know, if children are educated together, 
they are going to be more understanding of when they're out on the football field or, or in the supermarket and they see someone from school collapse to the ground having a meltdown. They'll think, oh, yeah, so-and-so does that at school. That's because they're autistic. Um, that's because the noise is hurting them. Or, or you know, they, they, you, you, you will get that. I mean, I would also say that inclusive education is a better quality of education for everyone. I think if a teacher has to work harder or smarter regarding you know, getting a, one child in the class to access their learning, it'll make learning more accessible for all children because you know, we, we know a lot of children. I like to learn visually. I mean, my teachers wouldn't have known that at school. So when they talk to me, and they probably thought, why isn't he listening or why isn't he being attentive? Um, but I think if, if there's a visual element to all lessons, then all children are going to benefit. If, there, if there's a, a tactile, um, you know, con activity um, to, to do in the class, all children will benefit. So I think, you know, the key benefit is that all children will benefit. I think the difficulty is that school leaders that aren't inclusive don't get that. They think they've got to instruct children, cram them with all the knowledge to get to a standardized test score at the end of the term or the year. Uh, and I think the braver leaders and the more inclusive leaders will realize that take the time to make classrooms more accessible for all and all children will, will do well. And so, you know, the scores on the doors at the end of the end of the year, they'll look after themselves because all children will be learning and, and, and they'll be enjoying learning more as well. So to me, that's the, you know, that's, that's the in-class benefit. I mean, we would like, wouldn't we, to, you know, we, we don't want to reinforce or perpetuate divisions in society. You know, that, that worldwide, you know, there's divisions everywhere, aren't there? Um, and so inclusive education allows all of us to work, walk a mile in someone else's shoes, so to speak, isn't it? And get to understand and think, actually, I really get now why so-and-so puts their hands in, in their over their ears at times. It's because the noise is getting too much for them or that teacher's voice is a bit of a pitch that, that, that they find really, really difficult or that the sun coming in through that window is going to affect somebody else as well. And, and I suppose it's all of us being aware to that, isn't it? So, you know, you were saying, Marla, so if we're out playing out in the park, in the supermarket, we just all have a better understanding of why, of why we all act the way we do. Very much so. And Mana, what is your experience about it? Um, how do you find uh, child, early childhood inclusion can contribute to the overall benefits in the education system and in children's lives as a whole? Okay. Um, well, I, I, I think, um, you know, to, to say that um, not only India, but all the countries do continue their work uh, towards, towards, you know, attaining inclusion in um, the school education system so uh, and uh, in india we do have really good uh, policies and acts from the center um, wherein uh, there are provisions offered but as michael said that how much you know the system actually the, the school systems uh, take it as their responsibility uh, and provide that sort of service to the schools uh, is something uh, you know which 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 is very tricky, uh, especially in India, because uh, as I said earlier, that the education is state subject, so it may be happening very, um, very, you know, very smoothly in in a place like Delhi, as compared to where we are in Gujarat. So, you know, that is my take on that. Yeah, and I always uh, think that education system is uh, a part of the society itself. All the policymakers are also part of the society itself. And uh, society needs to appreciate the fact. And I personally feel uh, that it is important for us as uh, inclusion, inclusive education consultants to keep ourselves focused about changing this perceptions of the society, altering mindsets, raising confusion, and helping to end unfair prejudices about people with additional needs. And uh, I remember my first interaction over phone with uh, Mala a few months ago. And Mala, do you remember? What did you say? You had a sigh of relief and said, thank God, at least someone else understands inclusion. Can you recall it? 
And uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, most of us, uh, as you said earlier in the show, that most of us still tend to use problematic terminology in referring to additional needs. Like in school and everywhere in the society, we still call it a learning disability. We give emphasis on the word disability more at all times, where um, many around the world call it a learning difficulty or a learning difference. We love to use the phrase uh, wheelchair bound. Don't you think yeah. it should be wheelchair user? Mm. So as society, we have our own challenges to make meaningful inclusion really happen. It's my take, actually. And uh, I will come to you, Michael, once again. What are the other challenges of inclusion around the world? I'm not talking about only India or the UK. Uh, what do you think? What can be the other challenges? I mean, I think I think the main one, and 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 you've just hit on it there, Manabina and 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 Mala. I, you know, it's it's another topic, isn't it? But our socio-economic system, you know, and 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 that predominantly is capitalism around the world. Needs, um, it needs division in society. That you know, capitalism feeds on it, on division, and reinforces it. It creates it because it needs different um it, it needs different types of workforce and and you know to maintain that system so i don't want to dwell on that here that's that's another topic but i think in a way we're working against the tide aren't we we're working against the flow so i, I think you know we we can we can have you know teachers reading stories to children like my hair um you know that talks about celebrating difference and diversity and and, and bringing this closer together we can have an inclusive curriculum you know we can have all of those things but outside of school the wider societal societal influences are really really strong um and a lot of the work that i do around disadvantaged pupils um you know we do make a difference but i'm always aware of those wider ones so let me give you an example in in the uk you will know um but not everyone, that, that that schools are given additional money to support children um, it's called the pupil premium and it's to support children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and the idea is that that money is used in schools to close the gap between you know more affluent middle class pupils who do a lot better um, than those who come from disadvantaged um, families you know they, in, in terms of whether it's low income or no income and, and, and all those other barriers so we can do projects in schools to do that and you know we suggest lots of strategies and they're quite effective but you know to to, to get all children attaining at a high level is something that that, that 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 our society doesn't lend itself to because you know we need different types of workforce um you know, I'm not. I'm not going to go on about Karl Marx. I mean, I mean, I, you know, Karl Marx. I, he, he was writing a long time ago, but he talked about different levels of labour. So you needed skilled workers, but you also needed a labour reserve. People that are unemployed for a lot of the time, but can be pulled in by employers um, when, when, in an upturn period. So, in a way, bizarrely, what we're trying to do in schools is going against the tide. Um, so that is a huge challenge, isn't it? Um, and we can only chip away at that bit by bit. Um, and I've got lots of stories where children have made remarkable progress in schools and they have, you know, caught up with their middle class peers. But those are tend to, I think they're exceptions rather than the rules. Um, the other the other the, the other challenge is, you know, coming down the scale a little bit. Um, it's the accountability thing in this country. School leaders, and I've touched on it already, are worried about their exam results. So they will see that the easiest way to exam results is to exclude children that misbehave a little bit, um, segregate children who find it hard, and just focus on those children that are going to get the grade. So there's that, there's that um, element. And I think sometimes the belief in schools that it's just too hard, you know, to, to have inclusive classrooms. Teachers see that as, well, that means I've got to have three different groups on the go. I've got to have 10 different worksheets. I've got to ask a load of range of questions. I need more resources. Um, the work I do with schools and my colleagues is that actually it, it isn't harder. Um, 
it, 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 you, you need to think a little bit more about things, but it's not harder. But there is that a belief it's just too hard. So why are we bothering with that? Let's just crack on and, and get our good exam results. It's, um, yeah, frustrating. Um, but we've got, we've got good stories as well to tell, haven't we? And that's always good to, good to say. And, and I know some fantastic inclusive schools in this country and children with SCND and children at a disadvantage do absolutely brilliantly. And they, they really enjoy school. So we need to keep holding on to that. Yeah, thank you. And Mana, would you like to add something to it? Um, well, I think the entire education system, so, um, you know, it, it really is very different um, in India. So, you know, the uh, disability is, comes under the Ministry of Human Resource. I'm sorry, the education comes under human resource and uh, the disability comes under Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. So um, there is a lack of an alignment amongst these various bodies. Uh, and you have RCI also that. So if we have expectation from mainstream teachers to differentiate their teaching, um, you know, to make it more inclusive, then uh, who is supposedly to provide them with this training? Because as far as RCI is concerned, um, they only train uh, the SEN professionals. So their CRE programs are also to retrain the um, professionals who are already registered with them. Uh, and in uh, yeah, and the programs are not sufficient to oh, get yes. to some neurodivergent children because most yeah. of the programs are for um, mental retardation, maybe the intellectual disability, at the same time, the hearing impairment or visual impairment. But you will not, you will hardly find any program for autism or dyslexia or maybe ADHD. Will, uh, very, very limited, very limited. And India is a huge country. And if there is a course only in the capital city in Delhi, and it's not possible for someone who is, uh, suppose, in uh, Assam to go to Delhi and uh, to to pursue that course. So that is also the unavailability, non-availability of uh, courses is also an issue, I think, the RCI affiliated courses. That, that's right. Uh, Manavina, in 2016, with the RPD, uh, RPWD Act, we, we did get uh, 21 categories of disability. Uh, yeah, but as yeah. you said, CINA looks into those specific areas of disability. And we do not have a single body or single university which can provide uh, information or training to, uh, yeah. for the professionals. So how do we expect the mainstream teachers to be able to you know, right. have that one child in their classroom? And be able to, uh, you know, differentiate their lesson to meet the needs. So, um, and, you know, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Please carry on. Carry on. And I was just going to say that um, one of the things which is, um, which uh, the education system in the UK um, has is um, that if the family moves from one county to another, then the child's education plan, which Michael mentioned about education healthcare plan. Uh, and the education system does not change for that child. You know, so uh, so when we have a child who has got a plan from a school, move to a different school, they still carry on with that plan. You know, they yeah. still have those professionals working. Uh, you would agree. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's it's. Uh, the schools are responsible to alter their resources, infrastructure, and update their teacher training, um, or sensitize the parents and community to be able to let that plan actually happen for that child. And so, throughout the uh, throughout until they reach the age of uh, to be eligible for some sort of training and leading to a meaningful employment and eventually to a, an independent living. So. Uh, and this may vary as per the disability, you know, or the need of the individual. Uh, but planning for every single child is, I guess, the actual work which uh, the system of every country should look at. You know, the, mm -hmm. valuing every single child and, you know, with dignity. Very much so, very much. Uh, thank you, Mala, for your inputs. And uh, we are uh, almost at the end of this session. Uh, so before we leave, any concluding uh, suggestions for our viewers? Michael. Um, I suppose the main thing, you know, I, I think we need to make sure educators have the training they need, um, the, the, the funding they need. Um, I think we need to empower parents um, to assert their children's right to education inclusive settings. 
Um, I think we need to work with communities rather than schools. Um, you know, as well as schools, I mean, you know, work with communities, involve, involve professionals and community groups and all the support available to a community. And, and I think hold governments to account, you know, local government and national government. You, you know, I don't think we do that enough. In this country, there, there is well-defined equalities legislation. It's very rare that parents or, or, or community groups will use that. You know, it, it's there for a reason, because that equalities legislation, I see that being broken every day in schools. Um, you know, and 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 I, yeah, we need to we need to hold hold schools and and governments to account. Um, I think it's about yeah, yeah, making schools safe and welcoming places. And, and I know it's easier than done, but you know, a school where children feel happy and safe and trust the adults and enjoy their learning, um, and they will make progress in those situations. Um, it is a challenge, um, and and I suppose that my final word is it comes down to leaders. We need leaders in schools. That are inclusive and get or get everything that we've been talking about today. If they get that, they're going to instill that in their staff, and and it'd be a lot, a lot better. So yeah, leadership in schools absolutely vital. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Mana, your concluding suggestions for our viewers, please. Right, um, I I would say one of the things uh, which is very important important is coming to be together of professionals. You know, like the platform you are providing, Manabina. So, you know, this is very important to influence the whole idea of inclusion. Um, I would say parents to know the rights, their rights and the child rights, and be confident in, uh, as Michael said, asking questions, you know, ask the whys and hold people responsible for providing um, what is well in their rights and in their child rights as well. Um, and when we have a group of parents uh, talking the same language, asking the same question, um, one can imagine the influence that would have on the system. And I would also like to add that in recent times, we have seen in India the kind of support our society can bring in You know, during the COVID times. The network of common people became rock solid during this time. And uh, therefore, I, I think my uh, whole now focus would be on how to reach out the young generation. Uh, you know, so a sensitization not only in uh, in school for the teachers, but for the children, uh, for the young mm -hmm. adults. So going to schools, colleges, universities, and making them aware that uh, these provisions um, are for all the children, and uh, therefore the sensitization need to happen there. Um, and it also brings us to the theme of uh, this episode, where the center is early childhood. Uh, and I'm sure we all would agree that young minds are easy to mold than the grown-ups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mala. And uh, thanks a lot, Michael, for your time and support. Uh, for the a second pleasure. Time. A pleasure. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll come back a third time, Anavina. Maybe you might want me back oh, again. Definitely. <laughs> I would love to have you both once again as experts on my show in the near future. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And to my viewers, please uh, do send us your uh, queries and suggestions. We would love to address them. And also, please uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page for the announcement of the 22nd episode of Let's Talk Inclusion. Hope to see you soon. Till then, take very good care of yourself and keep India in your prayers. Bye-bye. Bye, Michael. Bye, Mala. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Michael. Bye, Michael.